We here at Gospel Express are very grateful for the opportunity to bring hope through Jesus Christ to you all. And one of the ways is through this From Bondage to Freedom seminar. And this four lesson seminar includes topics such as how we are created for relationships, how to work through broken relationships, and find healing for the wound of rejection, and then to experience true freedom through forgiveness. And you know, we trust these biblical principles and practical illustrations that are taught will be a great source of encouragement and to truly understand what it means to go from bondage to freedom. And of course, we're talking about freedom in Jesus Christ. And so have your books ready, your hearts open to the Holy Spirit as you give your undivided attention to instructor Merv Wenger. Welcome to the From Bondage to Freedom Seminar. We're so glad that you joined us today for this seminar. Actually, we are going to be looking at four different topics as we go through the seminar. Uh, the first one today, we'll be looking at uh, created for relationships. The second one will be broken relationships. And you know, all of us can identify with broken relationships. We've all experienced it. It's been a part of our lives. It's a part of living in a fallen world. And so often, the result of broken relationships is rejection. And in our session number three, we'll be talking about rejection and how that affects us in our lives, in our decision-making process. Often it affects us in a very negative way. And uh, so we'll be talking about that in session three. Session four, the last session of the seminar, will be on forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is a spiritual ointment that God uses to bring healing to the, the uh, hurt, the pain of broken relationships and rejection. You know, my friends, God has a purpose. God has a plan for you and for me, for all of us. God has a purpose for us. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, no matter what our past has been, God has a purpose and a plan for us. In our books, in the introduction, you'll see several verses here from Jeremiah 29, very precious verses. And I'd like to start with, by reading those verses from Jeremiah 29, verse 11. The Bible says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Friends, I believe that God will meet us at our point of need. In fact, in the context that uh, the Lord spoke this through the prophet Jeremiah to the children of Israel, they were in captivity. The reason they went into captivity was because they had forsaken the Lord. They had followed idols, forsaken the Lord, and God allowed them to go into captivity. But God is speaking here, speaking words of uh, encouragement, words of blessing. He says, you know, I have plans for you. Although you disobeyed, you ended up in Babylon, I have plans for you, good plans to prosper you to, to, and not harm you, but to do you good, to give you hope and to give you a future. And friends, I believe that God has that promise for us as well today, no matter who we are. The key is that we seek him with all of our heart. And I trust as we go through the seminar that we will simply open our hearts, our minds to the truth of God's word. You know, God has a purpose. God has a plan for us. And really, I like to think of it this way, that in Scripture, in the Bible, God gives us very specific instructions. In fact, it is our owner's manual. Really, we think about it. You know, put it this way. We buy a piece of equipment or an appliance or a tool, and, you know, we open it up, and sure enough, there's a pamphlet, and uh, it's uh, something like this, an owner's manual. What is that owner's manual for? 
Well, it does several things. It tells us how to use the appliance properly, how to get the best use of it, how to maintain it properly so that it will give us much use for many years. And, uh, and, and really, depending on what tool it is, it will tell us how to use it safely. That's another important aspect of it. The owner's manual, if we don't ignore it, which I confess, sometimes I've done, I got a piece of, I got a piece of equipment, a tool or whatever, I open it up, okay, there's the owner's manual, but, uh, oh, I don't need that, I know how to do this. I'm afraid so often in life, that's the approach we take. We say, I know how to do life. And we ignore God's owner's manual. But my prayer is that as we go through our time together, that we would simply open our hearts, our minds to the truth of God's word. What is God speaking to me? He does have a message for all of us and his God's Spirit is very faithful in proclaiming to each one of us in our hearts the message that he has for us. And certainly as believers, born again children of God, I believe that God's ultimate purpose and plan for each one of us is that we bear much fruit. And what does that fruit look like? Well, in Scripture, Galatians 5, we see the fruit of the Spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, the faith, the meekness flowing from our lives. And that brings God much honor and glory when that flows from our lives. But you know, sometimes because of some of the hurt and pain of our past, we respond in negative ways when certain things happen because of some of the wounds in our past. And so that's what we want to talk about as we go through our, our, the uh, seminar together. And uh, my prayer is that we simply be open to allow God to minister to us. Let's just pray as we get started. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be together in this way. May you minister to each of our hearts in a very special way. Meet us at our point of need. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In your books, I invite you to turn with me to page number one, actually, Created for Relationships. And friends, I believe that this is really such a key to this whole seminar. I mentioned a moment ago that God desires for us to really, truly experience the freedom in our lives. That is God's heart. That is God's desire. But God has created us with that freedom of choice. Yes, in his owner's manual, the Bible, he gives us very clear direction of how we are to order our lives. And yes, with that, if we choose to ignore God's owner's manual, there are certain consequences. The other side of it is, when we follow God's owner's manual, the Bible, the blessings will be ours as well. And uh, so session number one here, created for relationships, I believe is so very important that we truly understand God's purpose, God's plan going back to creation. Why has he created mankind? Why has he created you? What is your purpose in life? Does God have a purpose for you? Let me assure you, yes, he does have a purpose and a plan for each one of us. And uh, so while this first session is so foundational, it is really so important that we get a good grasp on why God created us. And we go back to Genesis 1.1. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, we don't understand everything about creation, but I believe that God gave us what we need to know about what happened back there, uh, creation. In fact, in Genesis 1, we have the overview of what happened in day 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. 
And uh, then in Genesis 2, uh, it's very interesting. We have some very details there of what happened, especially on day 6, that really fills us in and gives us a, a broader perspective of it. But there in Genesis 1, we see that God created the heavens and the earth, simply spoke the world into existence, the, the, the stars, the sun, the moon, and all that. He spoke into existence. After that, he created the animals, the fish of the sea, and all creeping things. And it's very interesting, on day six, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Think about that a moment. God said, let's make man in our image and in our likeness. What could be one reason why God chose to create mankind in his image and in his likeness? I'm sure there's many different reasons, but one key reason that I believe why God created mankind in his image is so that we can relate with Creator God. Not only that, but isn't it amazing that Creator God desires that fellowship and that relationship with His created human beings? God desires that. And God has created mankind in such a way that we have that freedom of choice. We can choose whether we're going to serve God or whether we're going to live for self. The choice is ours. God will never force us. Oh, yes, the blessings and the benefits of serving him, as we read in Scripture, those are very powerful. That's very true. But at the same time, God will never force us. We have that freedom. We have that choice. And I believe at the same time, God has created us in such a way that we have that desire for that fellowship and that relationship with Creator God. And unless we have that fellowship, unless we have that relationship, there's an emptiness. There's a void on the inside. You know, it's interesting Actually, look in your books on page two. The top of the page there mentions the fact that all across the world, in every tribe and nation, there are people, people worship something. And notice the four pictures there at the top of page two. You know, it can be through tribal dance, idol worship, prayer, mosque, shrine, the list goes on and on. Bottom line is this. Every tribe, every nation has that desire. Mankind has that desire within themselves to worship something, to worship God. In fact, God has put that within us so that we worship Him. We have that desire. We're born with that. And again, without that relationship with God, there's an emptiness, there's a void. And yes, all this other items of worship. In fact, as we read through the Old Testament, we see that all the time, where the, uh, the people were worshiping idols, making these images and bowing down to them and worshiping them. Why? Because we're created with that desire to worship. And God gave us that desire so that we worship him. But unless we really, truly worship creator God, that emptiness and that void continues on the inside. Now, unless we have that relationship with him, we have that broken relationship. And that broken relationship means pain. Pain. Here in America, how do we deal with that? You know, many people here in America do not have that fellowship, that relationship with Creator God, so they're substituting it with something else. 
In fact, I don't know that I've ever seen anyone make a golden calf as such and bow down to it here in America. I've never seen that happen. But what are some other ways that we in our society try to ease that hurt, that pain of broken relationships? Notice the paragraph right under the uh, photos there on page two. Let's just read that. In our society, Drinking, drugs, wealth, and entertainment are primary ways we attempt to cover the pain of broken relationships in our lives. We refuse to acknowledge that we're hurting, choosing to cover it up with alcohol, drugs, or whatever. And this brings us into a world of fantasy while God is a God of reality. Now, what are we thinking about when we say this brings us into a world of fantasy. What is that referring to? Well, fantasy simply means believing what is not real. In other words, believing the lies of the enemy, the lies of Satan. Remember, Satan is a liar. He's a father of lies, and he would have people believe lies. Actually, where will that lead us? Will that lead us to freedom or to bondage? It leads us to bondage. And let's think of it this way. You know, the paragraph we read there just a little bit ago uh, mentioned the fact that people try to fill that emptiness and that void with all kinds of stuff, drugs, alcohol. You know, and it can go, it, it, it can go with whatever. It, it can be wealth. It can be money. It can be... Uh, position or whatever that we try to find fulfillment, purpose, and meaning in life. Let's put it this way. A person says, believes, okay, if I only had this, you fill in the blank, if I only had this drug or this position or whatever or this amount of money, then I would be really fulfilled. I would be totally fulfilled. I would be totally happy. Life would be absolutely wonderful. Oh, is that the way it works? What if when I achieve that goal, I meet that, I, 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 I get that, whatever it is, drugs, alcohol, wealth, money, whatever. Is that fulfillment? Oh, but for a minute, right. You know, the Bible tells us that the pleasures of sin are but for a moment. <laughs> They're here today, gone tomorrow. And then what? Yes, there's a certain satisfaction in it, but it's so short-lived. Once we achieve that, okay, after a while, now what? We need some more, don't we? All right. So we achieve, we work, we get, we get some more. We, we, we get some more of that stuff whatever it is. Okay, now life is good. Now surely I'm fully fulfilled and, and uh, yes, I'm great. Oh, really? Am I? But for a moment, right? And then we need what? Some more. Now let me ask you a question. Is that a picture of freedom or is that a picture of bondage? It's bondage, isn't it? Yes, it is. Fantasy is believing what is not real, and that is going on the road to bondage. Satan would have us to believe if we only had this, then life would be perfect and we'd be fully fulfilled. Doesn't work that way, does it? So what is the answer? Notice reality. Believing truth. What is truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth, believing God. And that is what sets us free. Believing God, believing truth, and may I say, being truthful. That is what gives us the freedom in life. You know, there was a fellow that told me some time ago, he said, you know, really, sometimes, I, yeah, I want to commit my life to the Lord. 
I'm not quite ready to do it just, re- just now yet. Uh, first, I want to go and enjoy life. I, there's some things I want to do, and he, he, he mentioned a few things, and basically it was fulfilling the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. To him, he believed that was life at its fullest. Where did he get that thought? Did that thought come from God? Or did that thought come from the enemy, Satan? We all know the answer, don't we? Satan would have people to believe lies. The reality is we believe truth. And the truth is what will set us free and will meet us, will give us full purpose and meaning in life. So uh, I believe that is a very important concept for us to remember. Now, going back to the fact that God created mankind, Adam and Eve, put them in the garden there, and uh, before sin, uh, back there, just imagine with me a moment. What was it like there in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve, you know, the Bible says it was very good, And friends, I believe that when God says it's very good, that it was just that. I believe that Adam and Eve had that perfect relationship, fellowship with each other. Not only with each other, but also with Creator God. You know, there's some indication in Scripture that God would have come and walked there in the garden and had some communion with them, fellowship with them. Things were perfect until one day something happened. The serpent came to Eve and, uh, you know, had this question. Uh, So, Eve, what what, what did God say? Did God say you can't eat of the trees here in the garden? Uh, Are you restricted from eating the trees in the garden here? Eve said, oh, we, we, we can eat of the trees of the garden, all except for the one right here in the center of the garden. Uh, this tree, knowledge, good and evil, we're not to eat of it. In fact, she said, we're not supposed to touch it. Now, we don't have recorded that God said, don't touch it. Maybe that was a precaution that she had for herself. Well, if I'm not going to eat of that tree, I'm not going to touch it either. Not bad. And you know what uh, the serpent said? Oh, Listen, you know what? God knows that in the day that you eat of that tree, you know what's going to happen? Your eyes are going to be opened. You're going to be wise. You're going to be like God. So really what God is doing is he is keeping you under his thumb Yeah, he's keeping you from something good. That's really what he was implying, wasn't it? You know what, friends? uh, Satan hadn't changed his tactic a bit, has he? Now, he does that today, too. The illustration I gave you a little bit ago about that fellow that said, you know, I want to commit my life to the Lord, but first, yeah, Satan has blinded his eyes to the truth. Well, we know the story. The Bible tells us there in Genesis 3 that Eve looked at the tree, looked at the fruit, and she said in her heart she knew that, you know what? She saw that, oh, it's a a good tree. It's got some good fruit. I just wonder how it tastes. And what did she do? She took of that fruit. She gave to Adam. They both ate. Now, God had told them, the day you eat of that tree, you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. So what happened? What happened? Did they fall over dead? No, they didn't. But the question is, did they die? Yes, they died, may I say, spiritually. Because their relationship with God was severed at that point. They agreed with God's enemy, Satan, and that broke the relationship with God. It's interesting, there in Genesis 3, we read the account of God coming there after they had taken of that forbidden fruit and eaten, 
uh, God comes walking in the garden, the Bible says, in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve heard God coming, walking. And what did they do? They went and hid themselves. Now, why did they go and hide themselves? Because they had disobeyed. They were guilty. The guilt. And God cried out and said, Adam, where are you? Adam said, I, uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm hiding behind a tree. God said, why are you hiding? Did you eat of that forbidden fruit? You know what Adam said? Well, the woman you gave me. Oh, the blame game, right? Okay, it's always somebody else's fault, or is it? Bottom line is, a Adam did eat, right? He's responsible for his actions, right? Eve did eat. She's responsible for his actions, for her actions. And uh, so the result of Adam and Eve disobeying, it severed their relationship with God. Their relationship with God was broken. Notice the, uh, the key uh, truth there, bottom of page two, agreement with Satan breaks down relationships. Friends, that's so very important to remember. The result also of Adam and Eve taking of the forbidden fruit, eating of that forbidden fruit, the result of that is that every person born since the fall of mankind is born with that sinful human nature. Of course, the exception would be the Lord Jesus Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary, not, of, not, not a descendant of man as such, of sinful man, but born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. But everyone else born since the fall of man is born with that sinful human nature. You know, we, uh, we didn't ask for it, but we got it. It's just the way it is. We're born with that sinful human nature. You know, a little bit ago, we were talking about the fact that God has created mankind in his image and in his likeness. If you would, turn to page three in our books, and we notice here a diagram. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God, but yes, three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And uh, yes, God said, we'll make man in our image and in our likeness. So very, very, very similar, mankind is a three-part being as well. Although we are one, we're three parts. You know, in the Apostle Paul, there in 1 Thessalonians 5, he mentions the fact that he says, I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus. He mentions our three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Notice the diagram there on page four. Body, the outer layer. We are, for the most part, we're identified by our bodies. You see me? Yes, I'm identified as Merv. That's, we're recognized by our bodies. Yes, we have a name. And uh, then our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions. Uh, that is what we own. You know, our body is what we live in. Our soul, mind, will, and emotions, that's what we own. And then the center, the spirit, the, the inner core as such, often referred to as the heart of a person, really the center of life. May I say it's really who we are. You know, the Bible tells us that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, and, that, and another verse says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What is he talking about? Is he talking about this thing that pumps blood? No, he's talking about the spirit man on the inside of us. The heart is really who we are. And... Um, the uh, illustration is given there, center page four, 
uh, we have the, uh, an illustration given here. Of, uh, suppose a man suddenly dies of a heart attack. He's pronounced dead at the scene. And the question is, okay, what died? What, what, what? Obviously, his body died. And yes, when God created mankind, the Bible tells us there in Genesis 2, that when God created mankind, he breathed into man the breath of life. And man became a living being. And friends, I believe that life begins at conception. And, uh, and so what happens when our bodies die? The spirit departs. And the Apostle Paul put it this way, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I believe that, yes, when our bodies die, our spirit departs and is either in the presence of God or then forever separated from God. Our eternal destiny, I believe that at, at this point, at that point when we die, our bodies die, our eternal destiny is sealed. And uh, so that is what we're talking about here is uh, the fact that, yes, we are created in the image of God and uh, when God breathed into man the breath of life, yes, man became a living being. Never, the, 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 the spirit of man will never die, but will live on, either in the presence of God or forever separated from God after our bodies die. On page number five, let's look at the, uh, let's do the review here. And um, number one, the Bible tells us there in Psalm 139, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is because we are made in the image of God. Think about it. Isn't it amazing? We're created in the image of God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Think about it. The, all the intricate parts of our body, how God has designed us. Isn't it amazing? Wow. Creator God. Number two. The one who made us gave us an owner's manual. This is the book we refer to as the Bible. The Bible. That is our owner's manual. Number three. God is a God of relationships. In the following quotation of Jesus Christ, on which he said, hang all the law and the prophets, we find three foundational relationships. And, and Francis, I, b I believe that these verses are so very important. And uh, so let's read them here. Jesus is saying, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is a first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, isn't it very interesting to note, Jesus said here, you shall love the Lord your God. Isn't it interesting to note that he didn't say you shall obey the Lord your God? Oh, obedience comes as a result of our love, but what does it indicate when he says you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind? What does that mean? It means a relationship, doesn't it? Yes. The beautiful picture of our relationship with God. God desires that relationship with you personally. He desires that. Now, the three foundational relationships in life. First of all, relationship with God. Secondly, relationship with others. And then number three, relationship with ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, but I really don't very often think about the fact that, okay, I have a relationship with myself, 
But think about it this way. I believe that God has created us in such a way that we have a natural self, a, a healthy self-esteem. And God intends for us to take care of ourselves, yes, and to have that healthy self-esteem, really, and to accept ourselves the way that God has created us. And friends, I believe that if we are not able to do that, to accept ourselves the way that God has created us, then we will really be struggling in our relationships with other people, really. Now, these three relationships, yes, the first one is, may I say, that is of utmost importance. That needs to be number one our relationship with God. Obviously, if our relationship with God is not what it should be, may I say we will be struggling in our relationship with other people as well. So I believe they really go hand in hand and our very, all three relationships are very important. Now, in the uh, commandment here that Jesus said, yeah, gave, he said, the first and greatest commandment, to love the Lord God. That is the key. And then secondly, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now think about it. When we truly do that, in fact, Jesus said on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Really, truly, think about it. When we love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we live that out, flush that out in our relationship with others, wow, that takes care of a lot of issues, doesn't it? Takes care, lot, takes care of a lot of problems in the world if everyone would do that, wouldn't it? It would really be a nice, pretty, uh, a, a very enjoyable place to live in, wouldn't it? If everyone would do that. And so those are really key. Those relationships are really key. Those verses are very key. Number four, sin breaks down relationships. Every relationship ever broken in your life has been the result of sin. In the total absence of sin, there will be no broken relationships. Do you believe that statement's true? I believe it is. I believe it is. You know, you go back to the Garden of Eden before the fall of man, before sin entered, and Adam and Eve had that perfect relationship with God and with each other as well. Number five, God created us for relationships. Ultimately, he wants us to be his bride. Book of Revelation talks about the church, the call out ones, the believers as the bride of Christ. And so that is ultimately God's plan for his believers. Isn't that amazing? God really has a plan for his people. Number six, separation, especially from God, is called death. Therefore, connection with God is called life. Life. You know, the Bible tells us that um, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is how we have life and have it more abundantly. Okay, let's think a bit more about our identity. And uh, over on page six on our books, the question is asked, who am I? Uh, yes, we have a name, and for the most part, that identifies our, us as in our bodies as such. But is that, is our, our bodies the real you as such? Is it the real me? No, the spirit man on the inside. The real you is the spirit man on the inside. Now, in saying that, you know, God does not necessarily, how would I say, ignore the physical, the body as such. But I believe that, yes, the inner man, the spirit man, is of, may I say, utmost importance. 
to God. And there's a verse in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, where the Bible says, For this cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. What's he referring to? The outward man. He's talking about our body. You know, as we get older, we feel our physical, may I say, limitations? Uh, to be real frank with you, I do not have the energy that I did when I was 20 years old. But I'm very thankful for the health and strength and energy that God has given me and blessed me with. And so what the Apostle Paul is saying here is, yes, though our bodies are getting weaker as we get older, yet the inward man, the spirit man on the inside, is renewed day by day. We're strengthened day by day. How does that happen? With our fellowship, our relationship with Creator God. That is strengthened. And certainly we've been reminded several times already that God is a God of relationships. He desires that. And that is uh, so much what he, uh, what, what he wants to have with us is that, that relationship. And we also realize that the enemy is out to kill, to steal, to destroy, and to hinder our relationship with Creator God. In fact, there are several verses that talk about our, our standing, actually our standing before God outside of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, the Bible says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, friends, that's a picture of a person that does not have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's on the outside. He's without God. He has no hope. By the way, that's where we all were at one time. Or if you have not been born again by the Spirit of God, that is where you find yourself right now, separated from God on the outside. And in fact, uh, there are several other verses in 2 Corinthians 4. Uh, verses 3 and 4 talks about the fact that if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, of whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. And uh, so, yes, Satan tries to keep people from coming to the light of the truth, from coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's blinding their eyes so they don't see the truth, don't understand the truth. That is the work of the enemy. And, uh, but God has a greater plan. And, you know, the, the, the power of God is so much greater than the power of the enemy. And really, the enemy is defeated. Over on page 7, notice the, uh, um, the uh, top of page 7 there, we have the statement that is made, uh, the real problem is not our action, but our identity. Our identity. Why? because it is our identity that produces our actions. So, it's just this way. Why do sinners sin? Because they're sinners, right? They do what's natural. Yeah, living for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's natural. Now, on the other side of it is, those that have been born again by the Spirit of God, why does the love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, the faith, the meekness flow from their lives? And yes, the forgiveness, because we've been born again. Our identity has changed. We're no longer on the outside, but we're now on the inside, a part of the family of God. Remember, our identity is what produces our action. Yes, when we're separated from God, 
when we're, yes, we're all born with that sinful human nature. That's just the way it is. But when we come to Christ, we meet him at the foot of the cross, our identity changes. We're no longer on the outside, but we are now on the inside. On page seven, you'll see a very interesting question there in the box. The question is this. How long does a person have to go to church to become a Christian? What do you think? That's a really good question, isn't it? Well, look at the answer. You've got to turn your books upside down to read it, but that's okay. The answer is this. The same amount of time that a dog must sit in a garage to become a car. So how long does that take? Bottom line is it ain't going to happen, right? It ain't going to happen. The same way going to church is good, but going to church is not what makes us a Christian. In fact, it's very sobering to read in Matthew chapter 7. The picture there we have uh, really a judgment, a time of judgment and uh, Jesus was, uh, t t some came to Jesus, they're saying, you know, we did all these good things in your name. And they heard those words, those very sad words, those very devastating words, depart from me, I never knew you. I picture these were people that were in church all their life. They did a whole ton of good things. In fact, there was a fellow that told me some time ago, he said, well, I just, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can. And I just hope and pray that, you know, when life is over and I stand before God, that he'll say, yes, your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. So, yeah, you're good. You're cleared. Come on into heaven. Woo, it's not going to work that way. It's not going to work that way. And I'm afraid the picture that we see there in Matthew chapter 7 uh, are just those people that they did a lot of good things and they thought the good deeds will merit them eternal life. But it doesn't work that way. In order for us to, to, be, to merit eternal life, we need to be born again by the Spirit of God. And in fact, Jesus uh, shares this with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 where uh, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Bottom line is this. In order for our identity to change, we need to be born again by the Spirit of God. And may I say, when we are born again by the Spirit of God, it changes who we are. We're no longer on the outside, but we're now on the inside, a part of the family of God. Over on page 8, we notice the uh, uh, several things that are addressed concerning our, uh, our choices that we make in order to be born again. I mentioned a moment ago that God has created us with that freedom of choice. You and I choose whether we're going to live for self or whether we're going to live for God. The choice is absolutely ours. God will not force us. The choice is ours. But there are two decisions, two choices that you and I need to make in order to be born again. The first one is the choice to believe God. The second one is the choice to be honest. Simply be honest. And yes, if we choose to believe, then God will give us that gift of faith. 
we choose to be honest, God gives us the gift of repentance. And, um, you know, the Bible tells us there in, in Hebrews chapter 11 that without faith, it is impossible to please him. We come to God, we must come to him, uh, yes, in faith believing. Believing that God is who he said he is and that he will do what he said he will do. So yes, the choice to believe him, we say, God, I don't understand this, but I'm believing you. I'm believing you through the eyes of faith. Yes, I believe you. And God gives us that gift of faith. And then simply choosing to be honest, realizing that I cannot save myself and I'm lost. That is my condition without the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm separated from God. I do not have that fellowship with God. My relationship with him is broken. God, I need you. Repentance is simply agreeing with God. Agreeing with God. And um, our separation, bottom of page eight, has two components. First of all, sin, that of wrongdoing. And secondly, sinner, that of wrong being. Actually, those, you know, those probably should be turned around. It's, again, our identity that produces our actions. So, yes, a sinner, wrongdoing, wrong being, and then the result of that, the wrongdoing as such, the actions that follow uh, that. Now, over on page 9, it talks about the new birth process. You know, friends, I'm so thankful that God's plan of salvation is very simple. It's not difficult to understand. In fact, it is so simple that even a child can understand God's plan of salvation. And, uh, you know, simply God sending Jesus, Jesus born of the Virgin Mary, and yes, there he grew as a, into adulthood and as a young man, 30 years old, began preaching, chose 12 disciples to follow him, to be with him, instructed them, and yes, preached the gospel message of hope, of repentance, of salvation, and uh, healed the sick, fed the, mil the thousands, and uh, performed miracles time and time again. After three short years, he was condemned to die, nailed on the cross, and there, gave his very life, shed his blood. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Jesus, the sinless son of God. Jesus never committed any sin. Sinless son of God. He was qualified to be that sinless sacrifice for all of mankind. There on the cross, the Bible tells us that the soldiers pierced his side and out came blood and water. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Jesus dying on that cross, shedding his blood so that you and I can be forgiven of our sins. Yes, he was buried. The third day, he rose again. Today, he is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me. That simply means if you're a born-again child of God, he's up there working on your behalf. That gives me a lot of courage, gives me a lot of energy. He's working on my behalf. I'm a child of God. If you're a child of God, he's working on your behalf. God's plan of salvation, very simple. Offering it to whosoever will. We come, we meet Jesus at the foot of the cross. We say, God, I realize that I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. We cry out to him. We ask him for forgiveness. He extends his forgiveness so freely to us. Yes, several things are very important. First of all, we realize that we cannot save ourselves. And we realize that we are sinners in need of a savior. 
And then secondly, we realize that, yes, it is God that offers us salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ so freely. And we accept his forgiveness. And we meet Jesus there at the foot of the cross. And he transforms us, gives us that eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. The question really is this. Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? That is the most important question you can ever answer. Let's catch the review on page 10. Number one, the real problem is not what we do, but who we are. Who we are. Again, our identity. Number two, our identity is decided by our birth. The only way to change our birth is to be born again. Born again by the Spirit of God. That changes our identity. Number three, who we really are is not decided by how we feel, but by what God says. Whatever God says must come to pass. Number four. There are two primary choices God has given to man that will one day be taken away. The first one, the choice to believe him. And then secondly, the choice to be honest before him. And right along with that, number five, if we choose to believe, he will give us the gift of faith. If we choose to be honest, he will give us the gift of repentance. Not, ever, not all birth are the same. Not all new birth experiences are the same. Some are very emotional with many tears. Others are calm and decisive. What kind of experience you had is not so important as this question. Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? Who are you? Friends, that is the most important question you can ever answer in life. i just like to take a moment right now Maybe you have never made that choice, that decision to be born again by the Spirit of God. I invite you to make that choice right now to be born again by the Spirit of God. I'm going to pray with you. If you've never made that decision to be born again, I invite you to pray with me as we pray. You know, when we mean business with God, he means business with us. A simple prayer of faith. And God does a tremendous work in our hearts and lives. That transformation that happens when we surrender it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, if you've never made that decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, I encourage you right now, to pray with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, I confess that I am a sinner and I cannot save myself. I believe Jesus Christ, your Son, was born of the Virgin Mary and that he died for my sins on the cross. I ask you to forgive me of my sins to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I invite you to come and take over in my life. I want to serve you faithfully for the rest of my life. Lord, forgive me, cleanse me, purify me by your spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your salvation. Lord, I love you and I honor you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. My friends, if you have prayed that prayer, you've been born again by the Spirit of God. 
God does that work. Over on page 11, we see what happens when we are born again. We're part of the family of God. We're no longer on the outside, but we're now on the inside. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 the Bible tells us, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joined heirs with Christ. Isn't it beautiful? The picture we see here of being a part of the family of God, we're no longer on the outside, but we're now on the inside, adopted into the family of God. And yes, we have this precious right to call our Heavenly Father, Abba Father. That literally means Daddy Father. <laughs> yes a personal relationship, personal commun communion, fellowship with him. Right along with that, the Christian life is a growing experience. You know, the Bible tells us there in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, for as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. I found in the Christian walk, it to be a continual growing experience. I don't believe we ever come to the place where we can simply fold our arms and say, well, well you know what? We kind of got the edge on this thing. We're just going to coast right on into heaven. <laughs> I don't think it quite works that way, does it? But we continue to press on. We continue to grow in our fellowship, our walk with God. Now, Thinking about this whole concept of being born into the family of God, really, what does that look like? Over on page 12, I'm just going to run very quickly through this. It gives us an overview of what it looks like to be a part of the family of God, being born into the family of God. It is a birth born into a kingdom that cannot be seen with human eyes. Secondly, it is the divine nature placed in us. And then number three, it is a mystery that few people understand. And then number four, it is a treasure to be prized. And um, with that, it brings the precious right, the right to call God, our Heavenly Father, our Father in a personal way. He is our Heavenly Father. The question is asked, but what does the word Father mean to you? What comes to your mind when you hear the word Father? What kind of thoughts come to your mind? Notice the uh, pictures there on page 12. We have four of them here. First one there, beating. Second one, shouting. The third one, reading a story. The fourth one, gone. I'm wondering how many of you can identify with one of those pictures. I'm sure there's many other pictures that we could paint of our relationship and what we think of when we think of our father. They were talking about our earthly dad. That's what we're talking about. And certainly, I'm sure that uh, some of you have experience, had very good experiences with your earthly dad, and that is commendable. That is outstanding. But at the same time, we realize that that probably is not the case for most of us. We live in a fallen world, a broken world, and there's much brokenness, much, much. Uh, uh, much hurt, much pain when it comes to this. Now, notice there on page 12, we have several blanks here. And I really would like for you to think about this. The first one, on the following lines, write what the word Father brings to your mind. In other words, you think about your earthly dad, what thoughts come to your mind? Is it 
Is it uh, thoughts of uh, fear, of rejection, or is it uh, he had no time for me, or maybe a caring, loving person, a provider, or whatever. You simply, simply what, what thoughts come to your mind when you think about your earthly dad? And then secondly, the word father makes me feel, and you finish the sentence. How does it make you feel? Uh, does it make you feel loved or not loved? Cared for or not cared for? Uh, maybe afraid. Or maybe, yes, security comes from dad. I, I'm safe with him. Now, why, why are we talking about this? Well, there's several reasons that I believe it is important for us to consider this. And over on page 13, we have the three reasons listed here. First of all, a large part of who we are today is a reflection of the man we call dad. And then secondly, each of us have a strong tendency to look at God as we saw our dad. And then number three, we tend to become our definition of dad. And uh, so that is why we're talking about this right now, right here, and um, I believe the second one is so very important. And, you know, while I believe that that is primarily 90% uh, of the time, that is the case. Uh, we have a strong tendency to look at God in the same way that we saw our dad. Some time ago, there was... Uh, a survey done of uh, high school students, senior, I believe it's seniors in high school, survey done of, okay, what is your picture of, de of, of God? How do you picture God? And uh, I found one response very, very interesting, where the, the young man said, well, I picture God kind of like my grandfather, and apparently his grandfather was his, the father figure in his life, he said, uh, Grandfather, he's, you know, he's, he's at home some of the time. And when he's home, wow, he sets things in order. And, and you know, he's just, he's in charge. And everybody jumps when he jumps. And, and, and then all of a sudden, he's gone. And we don't know where he's at. He's out there somewhere. And, uh, you know, we don't know when he's going to come back. Oh, he'll come back sometime. And, uh, but when he comes back, then he sets everything in order again, and, and we got to walk the line. He said, that's how I picture God. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And to me, it just, yes, it was a confirmation of, you know, we have a tendency to look at God in the same way that we, same type of relationship that we had with our earthly dads as well. Now, for that purpose, it is very important that we, that reason, it is very important for us to, to have a proper view of God. You know, in Scripture, we can see very clearly who God is. The descriptions are very clear. And I'd like to just take a moment, run through these verses very quickly here on page 13. And uh, I encourage you, on your own, do read the context of these verses and, uh, and, and just allow the Spirit of God to minister to you. But in Exodus 34, the Bible tells us that our God is a merciful, gracious, and long-suffering God. In 2 Corinthians 1, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. In 1 John 3, the Father who bestows love. And in John 16, the Father who loves us. And then Galatians 4, a father who sends his own spirit into us so that we cry, Abba, Father, again, Daddy, Father, that concept. And then in 2 Corinthians 6, a father who insists on separation. Matthew chapter 6, he knows your every need. Our Heavenly Father knows exactly what our needs are. And then with that, in Matthew 7, is a father who gives good gifts. And in Luke chapter 12, a father who knows how many hairs you have. Isn't that amazing? 
He knows every little detail about us, including the number of hair on our head. And some of us don't have as many as what we once had. And, uh, but that is really, in a nutshell, a picture of who our Heavenly Father is. I don't know where you're at today in your evaluation of God or your thoughts concerning our Heavenly Father. But if you find yourself not aligning with truth, I invite you to simply talk to God about that and invite our Heavenly Father to change the way you see Him and align it with truth. I believe that that is so very important. Over on page 14, the design, our Heavenly Father loves us, He cares for us, and yes, there's two things that He wants to do in and through us as born-again believers. And uh, the first one there in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, the Bible says, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, dropping down to the blanks there, center page 14, God wants us to be like Christ Jesus, to be conformed to the image of Christ. That is really the heart's desire of God, that our lives may model the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a tall standard, isn't it? That's a high standard. Only by the grace of God, only by the grace of God can we do that. Another verse there in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 12, the Bible says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And then in Revelation 4, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Let's catch the blanks there, bottom of page 14. God wants us to bring Him glory. This means to make Him look good. Blank number 27 is good. As we become like Jesus, our lives are being cleaned up. This causes our life to reflect Jesus, which makes God look good. You know, that's just another way of saying we bring honor and glory to God. We make Him look good. And that certainly is our goal. Page 15, as we wrap up uh, this particular session here, the finish line in um, Revelation talks about Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife, Revelation 21, 9. And then in Revelation 19, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, his wife has made herself ready. You know, what a day that will be when we're in the presence of God. And yes, notice he calls the church, the called out ones, the believers, the bride of Christ, the Lamb's wife. Yes, very precious. What a beautiful picture that is. And uh, that is certainly a glorious future for us that we look forward to. But right here, right now, we're here in this fallen world with this uh, house of flesh that we, uh, yes, have got the flesh to deal with. So what is it that God wants us to do right now, right here in preparation for that great day when we will be in his presence. Notice in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27 that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And along with that in 2 Corinthians 7, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's catch the blanks there, bottom of page 15. We were all created for relationships. 
When these are broken for any reason, we experience a pain, a wound on the inside. Sometimes we recognize it and sometimes we do not. You know, those verses that we just read a moment ago, uh, talking about uh, not having any spot or wrinkle, uh, no blemish, uh, cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. You know, sometimes those wounds cause us to respond in negative ways that are not honoring to God. In the next session, we'll be talking more about that. Broken relationships and how that so often affects us in our decision-making process. Friends, my prayer is that, yes, we simply allow God to minister to our hearts as we look into his word. I invite you to come back for the next session. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we had to be together and to study your word. Thank you that you've created us in your image, in your likeness. May you perfect the message of your word in each of our hearts for your glory and for your praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.